quickly explain uh, the importance to our listener of the mitochondria and its function? Sure. So mitochondria are, you know, everybody's heard that mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell, and that's pretty much where all the knowledge starts. But mitochondria are sort of, you know, think of yourself, uh, think of them as cell organelles that power everything you do from moving to thinking to sort of recovering from exercise. So they produce what is called as ATP, which is sort of the currency, the energy currency in our bodies. And, and, and think of mitochondria as, as the battery inside a Tesla car, for example, that, you know, has a certain capacity to keep, you know, uh, driving the car. But after a while, you need to sort of, uh, um, you know, give it more sort of, it, you know, feedback and you need to nurture it. And, and so that's how these mitochondrial health is so key and mitochondrial function is so key so important to especially metabolic organs such as muscle, skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and a brain. Yeah, and as I've written about in most of my books, particularly the last two, our our mitochondria in general are on death's door. They have taken a beating that is actually unimaginable from our Western diet, (laughs) from our Western lifestyle, from from our environment, environmental toxins, you name it, mm-hmm. we have not been good caretakers of our mitochondria. Not at all, and you're absolutely spot on right. There are two, actually, two great uh, ways to boost your mitochondrial health, and that's regular exercise and, and calorie restriction. But as you mentioned, we, both, we have not been uh, kind to our my own mitochondria by not paying attention to what we eat and how we move around. Now, something that's probably not on everybody's radar, even though I think most people remember high school biology and seeing this mitochondria in a cell, and it's the powerhouse of the cell, but there's there's an important relationship between our immune system and mitochondria. Can you can you elaborate on that? Yes, sure. There's a there's a big uh, so. There, there, you know, a number of years back, this the hallmarks of aging were described, and these hallmarks of aging really all are deeply connected biological pathways. So there's, you know, sort of the uh, the DNA repair mechanism slowed down. You have the epigenetic alterations, uh, and, and and now, of course, the mitochondria are the central pillar to all these hallmarks and connect them. And now you have this chronic inflammation. So as we age, uh, or a, as we you know, we we have a more sedentary lifestyle, things like biomarkers like C-reactive protein, which is a marker of inflammation go go up. And and what we are seeing actually in a number of trials in older adults is that with declining mitochondrial health, there is this sort of both gut dysbiosis and chronic inflammation. And so the the immune system, the immune cells have uh, mitochondria that basically power off and shut off as we age. And that's the link between uh, immune cells and mitochondrial health. And I think one of the things that people, particularly during COVID, is immune function might be very useful. Uh, Plus, uh, particularly in terms of cancer, uh, we know that uh, one of the theories, which is widely accepted, that the reason cancer becomes so prevalent the older we get is because our immune guardians against cancer cells you're right, are, are, are underpowered or not functioning the way they should be. Sure. And, you know, we, we recent pu- recently published a, a, a fantastic paper in the, one of the highest ranking immune journals called Immunity. And we showed actually in this that in certain cancer models, uh, by improving mitochondrial health via, of course, the compound we'll talk about, urolitin A, you could actually uh, lower the incidence in these models of, of cancer recurrence. And more importantly, what the thing we are seeing is even once you treat the cancer, so once you do the chemo radio sort of new adjuvant therapy, the immune system is basically zero, you know, in the recovery phase. And so how fast it comes back to sort of reseed the immune system is, is the key determinant is mitochondrial health. Yeah, that, uh, you know, it's interesting as a transplant surgeon, uh, one of the things we, we learned early on was that 
the the older our patient was who we did a transplant in, uh, the much less immunosuppression we had to use. And in a way it was great, you know, oh, you're, you know, you're 75 years old, this is gonna be great because we don't have to give you a lot of immunosuppression because you're so re already immunosuppressed. And in a way that's actually very scary. Um, so this function of mitochondria in our immune system uh, clearly needs to be uh, given some attention. All right, so speaking of aging, what, what new pillars of aging have we learned about in the last couple of years? Well, I think uh, if you look at the hallmarks of aging, there is these nine hallmarks of aging that you know kind of link all the organelles of cell biology to the epigenetic alterations, as I was mentioning. In the last, let's say, decade or so, uh, the, a lot of emphasis has come on this gut microbiome dysbiosis, right? With aging, uh, the gut microbiome starts to alter, and, and, and that leads to declining production of gut metabolites, such as, you know, postbiotics, et cetera. And, and, and what happens is then, because of this chronic inflammation, so the immune system, we touched upon, uh, upon that, and the mitochondrial health and the declining mitophagy. Now, this is a term your listeners may or may not have heard. Uh, one of the new hallmarks of aging is declining mitophagy. What that means is basically is that the mitochondria are working over time as we age to deliver us the energy, but then a lot of them get corrupted and they get faulty. And, and the system that basically recycles this trash bin of poor mitochondria also slows down. And, and so how you can rev up and get all these bad faulty mitochondria packaged into garbage bin and then recycled so they can become healthy mitochondria is one of the, the new key pillars that uh, is, is getting a lot of interest and excitement. All right, so uh, as I mentioned before you know, in the introduction, uh, we've, we've known that pomegranates are pretty cool and that uh, pomegranates have uh, some very interesting polyphenols among gallic acid, mm -hmm. uh, but it was, it was really work on certain gut bacteria can transform uh, these polyphenols into urolithin A. Mm -hmm. Tell me all about that compound. Why is this, sure. why is this such a miracle? Um, sure. What's it, what's it do? Yeah. So, well, we've spent 15 years studying the pomegranate. So we started with the, with the whole fruit, uh, you know, because uh, much, you know, I, I was trained in medical school where nutrition was not well taught, but yet we all learned that, okay, nutrition needs to, you need to focus on certain superfoods. And so we started studying the pomegranate because there were all these, uh, in the literature, some exciting studies on cognitive function, vascular health, et cetera. And when we looked, we brought the biotech approach to basically deconstructing the pomegranate. And so we looked around and there were all these great compounds, as you were talking about. There were these polyphenols such as penicillagens and the elagic acid. But what we realized one day, as we were sort of screening all these hundreds of compounds inside the pomegranate, we gave them to a famous professor just in the university campus we are in here in the Swiss Institute of Technology. And he was running these sort of assays trying to see if certain worms and rodents would basically run faster and live longer. And one compound really attracted our attention and was a molecule called urolithin A, which is basically the, the result of gut microbiome digesting these polyphenols and releasing this postbiotic, which is the urolithin A. And so this professor, Professor Obrix, came running to our, to our lab and he said, what is this compound? Because it's boosting lifespan in worms by 50%. The older animals are, are running faster by 60%. And, and so that's really the whole journey of the last 10 years for us. You know, we, we got more and more interested into urolithin A and we started studying in different uh, human populations its producer status. So in terms of how, what is the percentage of population and people actually making the molecule. We looked in the French, the French were doing better, 30 to 40%, and I'm guessing because French are probably eating a lot of fermented food, et cetera. Then we looked in the American population and the Canadian population, and it was much lesser, 10 to 15, 20%, probably again, a mix of diet and, and, and sort of physical activity contributing to it. And that's led to, you know, kind of uh, us, synthesizing the molecule and, and starting to directly supplement in the randomized trials in, in humans and in older adults and in, 
of eight adults, and really seeing these remarkable effects on muscle health translate into humans with improved endurance and improved strength. So how exactly does it work? I mean, what, it's great that I'm going to have stronger muscles and I you know, might live longer. Mm -hmm. what, what is it doing at the, at the mitochondrial level? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so one of the, again, the first studies we did was we were looking in older adults and we took about 70, 75 year olds who had been running half marathons and training for half marathons all their uh, out of life, for example, and, and we took little chunks of their muscle. So this procedure called is a muscle biopsy, where you can take small chunk and look into how the mitochondria are behaving in the in the muscle tissue. And then we went and we took age max 70, 75 year olds who were really what we call as frail, uh, and they were sedentary. So they didn't have good functionality. They didn't have uh, uh, very good levels of physical activity, and they had lower muscle strength for sure. And, the, and we looked in the same way into their skeletal muscle tissue. We saw that both mitophagy and mitochondrial health was, was super compromised in the frail people. And so we took these same people, the sedentary frail people, and we started supplementing them with urolitin A uh, as a first randomized trial. And we saw when we took four weeks after, again, these muscle biopsies, we saw a big signature of improved mitochondrial health that was mimicking basically months and years of exercise. So basically it's hitting the same pathways of improved mitochondrial health and, and enhanced mitophagy that, for example, a six month aerobic exercise regimen would give you. So it's basically biologically hitting the same pathways. Oh my gosh, you mean exercise in a jar? <laughs> I, I, I don't think I can put that claim, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, scientifically and biologically speaking, yes, the pathways are pretty much similar to trials done in humans with aerobic uh, and, and resistance exercise and with uh, calorie restriction. So they, they all sort of point towards improved mitophagy and improved mitochondrial health. Is that the only human trial that's been done or are there multiple? There are multiple. So this is the, what I described to you as the first one where we only supplemented for a short period of four weeks just to see the biological effects. And then from there, we have done multiple randomized trials uh, that are now published in, in journals like JAMA and, and, and Cell Reports, really the top of the top journals. And, and, and in these randomized trials, we supplemented all the way for four months, so much longer uh, to see improved, uh, to see improvements in muscle function, and and so what we see in older adults, and by the way, the oldest participants we've had is is an 89 year old, very uh, spiky, robust lady who who you know it was a blinded trial, but she was convinced she was taking the active, and she kept coming to me. It's like you have to tell me if I'm right, if I took the uh, right product, and it not it was not a placebo. And when we unblinded, she was in the active, so she actually felt more energy, she felt resistance to fatigue. So what we are seeing actually in older adults is improved endurance and more energy. And these people can uh, do exercise longer. In little younger populations like the 50 and the mid 50 year olds who are also a bit sedentary, we have done another trial where we see improvements in things like VO2 max. So this is a marker of, uh, kind of de facto marker of improved mitochondrial health. We also see improvement in a test that a lot of clinicians use called the six minute walk test, which is basically measures how much of a distance you can walk in six minutes. So we see about a 10% increase there. And then of course the muscle strength is a standout improvement we see in these trials. So, and you mentioned this, the cancer trial. Yeah. Again, that's you, you find is because of the improved mitochondrial function in the immune cells? Yeah, so this is a, this is a pre uh, clinical trial that was published. We are now translating the, these uh, findings into two trials. So the effect is primarily even in the immune cells is because of improved mitophagy. Now what happens in the immune system, there's a very specialized cell called a memory T cell. And this is a cell that basically has a imprint or, or sort of a, uh, memory of how cancer cells look like or how viruses look like, etc. So what we see basically is that mitophagy is compromised in cancer uh, patients and cancer models in this particular memory T cell. And by supplementing with post the postbiotic urolitin A, we are reactivating mitophagy in this memory T cell. And that contributes to better immune function that contributes to 
clearance and, and, and better sort of uh, recovery from, from the cancer and cell that comes on the immune system. I want to backtrack for a second because uh, you're using the term postbiotic, yeah. something that I've written about in my last two books extensively. Uh, but most people know probiotics, uh, friendly bacteria. They know, hopefully, prebiotics, what friendly bacteria like to eat. Mm -hmm. But this concept of postbiotics is, for most people, they either haven't heard of it or, well, what the heck is that? So you go ahead and define it. I'll add if, okay. if I want to sure. add more. How's that? You know, I, I've read uh, your, I think your book and your sort of uh, speeches on, on the three Ps, the prebiotics, the probiotics, and the postbiotics. So the way I see them is that prebiotic is basically food for, for these healthy gut bacteria that coexist, you know, with us in, our, in, in, in their millions of them, and billions probably. And, and, pro, and that's sort of, you know, by using probiotics, you're trying to modulate this gut ecosystem that exists. So it's all good for them and all, and all good for, for, for their ecosystem. But then as a sort of a benefit to the host, which is us as humans, they take our food and, and nutrients from our food and they process them to release what are called as postbiotics that are beneficial to us as humans. So, th and that's a, a field that is coming up, postbiotics. There are a lot of them like short chain fatty acids, typically butyrate and acetate. And, and then there are from polyphenols derived uh, metabolites such as urolitin A, which is a postbiotic, but I let you add, add to it. No, I think uh, in my my book I'm writing right now it just does an incredibly deep dive into this incredibly complex ecosystem that you know we're just now beginning to understand because it's you know it, the amount if you actually look at you know at PubMed searches about the gut microbiome in like 2006 there's there's maybe you know a thousand searches uh, and now it, you know there's 30,000 um, yep. and, and it goes on and on so uh, what, what I think is fascinating is that these are communication systems mm -hmm. that now we now know exist between the gut microbiome and their host us mm -hmm. and we are actually dependent on these messages these postbiotic signaling molecules and what's, I think, exciting, particularly for urolithin A, is, yeah, pomegranate's got lots of really cool polyphenols. And we, you know, there's, there's history of how important pomegranates are in, in various, you know, brain health, heart health. But what you mentioned before is, particularly here in the West, America and Canada, we're screwed because we don't have the probiotics that are able to take the prebiotics in pomegranates and make the active postbiotic compound that's going to do all this good stuff. Yeah, that's and, and we're not. You, and you're right. We're not the French. Um, <laughs> well, well, I, I, you know, the Swiss I, are actually very close. Um, the story I tell, and it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's my personal experience, uh, I, I can personally, you know, I grew up in India uh, where there's rampant use of antibiotics. So for everything, when I was probably a kid with a little flu here and there, everything was antibiotics, right? So my microbiome just never recovered, just never recovered. And, and I can drink six glasses. And I've done this uh, challenge with myself. I've had six glasses of pure pomegranate juice and then I bled myself at different times to see if my body would make urolithin A. Guess how much it makes? Zero. Because, well, maybe there is hope if I eat a lot of fiber, maybe I figure out and we have spent years trying to figure out what's the right uh, mix of probiotics that will basically do the conversion. And the answer is it's very complex. The ecosystem is so complex. We have gone in and taken people, these lucky 10, 20, 30% people who are producers, we have really taken their, their stool samples and we have really done a high throughput uh, gut microbiome sequencing. We don't know. Uh, what we do see is that they have a very rich and diverse microbiome, which is rich in things like acromansia, which now is also, you hear it so much. But you know, to get there, you need to somehow, yeah, you need to give your system a, eat better, exercise, and then 
probably third pillar is what we're talking is supplementation for cellular health and postbiotics. All right. So that's why um, timeline and mitopure exists. The workaround you guys have synthesized. So what is MitroPure? How does it work? Yeah. So M MitoPure is the trade name for, for our proprietary urolutinae, which we synthesize with a patent protected methodology. And it's 99.9% uh, .9 identical to the natural uh, molecule. So the workaround is essentially, uh, and, and we have actually even we in the works of developing a, a small uh, health kit where people can actually measure themselves in, 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 in a lab or in a clinic if their body is actually, you know, you're, you, if you can. So what we do is we send you the pomegranate juice, you take the challenge, you just uh, take a few drops of blood from your fingertip, put it on a card, and, and, and we can tell you if your body is uh, already conducive to making your litane or not. And then you take the, the, the direct supplementation, so you take a dose of 500 milligrams of MitoPure, and then you see the change in bioavailability. And I can tell you that the average is about sixfold higher in even people who can make it. So for, for people yeah. like me who don't make anything, well, you go from zero to 400 uh, uh, kind of uh, levels of your litany pretty fast in about six hours of peak. So that's, uh, you know, what we have done. We have basically short circuited the whole uh, natural process of getting it from a diet or relying on your microbiome to, to produce it. So uh, everybody's going to want to know, is it a pill? Is it a liquid? Is it a powder? Uh, how can I take it? Yeah, so uh, we started out, uh, all our randomized trials at the start were with the pill. So, you know, very calibrated dose of 250 milligram in, in each pill. So uh, the doses we are seeing uh, that have the best effect in clinical studies are 500 milligram and then the gram gives even a much better response and a much quicker response, but most people do take 500 milligrams. So it's basically two pills. And, and, and since then we have also gone in and because good science and good nutrition should come with good taste as well. So we have developed a lot of food products. So there's a, you know, these berry and, and uh, uh, ginger flavored uh, powders now that come that you can mix in your smoothies and your high protein shakes. And there's even a product with 20 grams of whey protein, sort of hitting on muscle mass and muscle energy at the same time. So this is the whole breadth of our product portfolio that whatever lends with your lifestyle. Now, you mentioned early that obviously mitophagy is a good thing. Yeah. Um, re basically recycling our damaged mitochondria and i've written about kind of the last thing you really want to do is have these mitochondria uh, simplistically explode and uh, throw their pieces uh, out into the cytosol because the the membrane of mitochondria mitochondria are actually engulfed bacteria ancient and our immune system actually views uh, mitochondria, at least the wall of mitochondria, as an evil bacteria. And it can actually produce inflammation as these mitochondria die inappropriately. So you're right, recycling these guys is, a, is, is really beneficial in lots of ways. Yeah. Now, you mentioned that fasting does this, and as, as you know, uh, I'm a big fan of time-restricted eating, uh, intermittent fasting. Is it the same mechanism that uh, might appear hits? Uh, you yeah, so fasting induces autophagy at the high level. So autophagy is basically recycling of the whole cellular machinery, yeah. right? And, and a focus autophagy is what is called, we call it, if it's just focused in the mitochondria recycling, that's what we call as mitophagy. So both urolitin A and fasting are known to use autophagy. Now, what we see very specifically with urolitin A in different uh, trials and different models is this unique activate ability to activate mitophagy specifically, right? So uh, we have compared uh, different markers in, in different uh, experimental systems comparing caloric restriction to um, supplementation with urolitin A, and it's pretty much similar in terms of autophagy even. So it's both a combination of autophagy and mitophagy. And getting back to the kind of the earlier studies, particularly in worms, worms are actually a really good model for 
lifespan. Um, and actually, believe it or not, gut health. Um, and so worms with this compound were literally living 50% longer. Yeah, one of the reasons why a lot of aging research is done in worms is they live about 20 to 25 days max tops. And, and, and so uh, one of the most potent compounds that are known to uh, extend lifespan do it about 20, 25%, things like resveratrol and NAD boosters. Uh, one of the reasons we got so excited was uh, year early today in these initial experiments that we published in, in Nature Medicine was doing it by like 45%. And, and that's kind of, yeah, unheard of. And that's what got us excited. And obviously, you can't make any qualifications that um, my taking this product now for a year and a half has already extended my lifespan by 20 years. Well, that's not what we are about. I think the, <laughs> the goal is health span, right? We, we, we hear, you know, exactly today, the whole longevity space is being split into two. One says, oh, we want to live to 120, 130 years, which is really increasing lifespan. And, and I think you can achieve that realistically if you focus on health span extension. So moving around, you know, crossing the road in the 15, 20 seconds, they give you, you know, older people to cross the road and not get hit by a moving car. I think that's the functionality is so key. Got back to your lithin A. Uh, is there a time to take it? Uh, if I'm a 20 year old athlete, is that going to improve my performance? or I'm a 50 year old and noticing that I'm losing muscle mass every year, no matter what I do. Uh, wh when should I start this stuff? Yeah, so, well, most of our early studies focus on older adults and overweight middle-aged adults, because that's where we knew the mitochondria were impaired and mitochondria would be compromised. And we could see it, we could detect signals to show the efficacy. But when we launched it, to our surprise, we, we thought this would be mostly be a uh, uh, advanced nutritional product that a lot of older adults would be take, taking. But to our surprise now, a lot of our co consumers are, are very active. They are these weekend warrior sort of uh, profile that uh, wants to focus on health, wants to preventively address their health issues in their 40s and early 50s rather than wait for you know the symptoms to happen like modern medicine would uh, wait for frailty and sarcopenia to manifest before starting to think about it and a lot of athletes a lot of uh, two of the front cycling teams are are on it and, and a lot of uh, top nba players are taking it and, and that actually made us think why are these players uh, so, so much believe in the in, in your latin when this sort of the science is still emerging on, on, on that as aspect. And, and so we actually, that motivated us to launch a big study in Australia with one of the most uh, revered sports nutrition researchers, uh, a lady called Professor Louise Burke uh, in, in the Australian Catholic University. And she's been studying elite athletes for a good part of three decades. And she said, well, a lot, a lot of times overtraining impairs mitochondria. And that's what I think where your compound is actually acting is that some of these players are playing five NBA games or, or riding a bike for 50 kilometers to 60 kilometers uphill, downhill for, you know, months and, and the body just doesn't have the time to recover. And so now we have just finished this study and the results hopefully will come out uh, mid-year. It, it is that we think that by, by using the postbiotic and even elite athletes, we can blunt the muscle damage and, and accelerate the muscle recovery. So that's one stream of uh, research that is happening. The other is in sort of the hospitalized patient settings. Now, each day you spend in the hospital that you, and you put it very well, you start losing muscle mass at a very accelerated phase. And so we think by supplementing in that kind of uh, hospitalized, immobilized setting, uh, we can also accelerate the recovery uh, of these people. So, you know, the research is just building up and, and many more people are starting to study this. Going back a second, uh, fasting is one way to produce autophagy. Mm -hmm. uh, so can you, have you looked at, can you combine uh, fasting or exercise and MitoPure and get an even additional effect? Yeah, so we've done it. Uh, we've uh, looked in different models uh, where we've added uh, exercise regimens and, and showed that endurance improvements and strength improvements are even 
sort of uh, add-ons with, with supplementation with urolithin A. The study that I was just describing with elite athletes, well, these guys are basically, yeah, the, the exercise gurus, right? So they, they, that's all they do. So if we can improve somebody with a VO2 max of 70 and make their VO2 max better, gosh, uh, that's really the holy grail of, of uh, all yeah. clinical research. Uh, but you're right, the timing is very key as well. So fasting, uh, overnight fasting induces autophagy. And so we use a similar approach in our, in our trials is that we supplement early in the morning in the fasted state. So we get the best induction of mitophagy. And that's what we even recommend consumers today that take this, the pill or the powder first thing in the morning. Ah, good, good point. Um, so, and this all kind of started because you guys were interested in pomegranate juice. It all started with the pomegranate, uh, the, the, the fruit and, and its magical healing powers and everything inside it. That's how it started. Now, there's obviously lots of other um, historic compounds that have purported uh, history of health benefits. Mm -hmm. And I would assume there are other compounds that you're also interested in can you can you share any of your other research yeah i mean for example uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, fruits and nuts also have allogitanins and 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 so uh, the, the body makes the majority of the urolithin is urolithin a but there are other urolithins that the body could make as well there's urolithin b c and d and we've looked at them it's just that urolithin a is just so much more potent than the others, which is why, you know, as a small research company, you can only put so many research dollars into one area. But we are we are now getting excited. We talked about uh, adding on with high protein because I think for the whole muscle space, and I've done trials for, uh, looking at muscle function improvement for a good part, two decades, uh, adding 20 grams of whey protein or alternative pea protein, for example, was supposed to be the only way to build muscle mass, right? And, and those studies wouldn't work without adding exercise regimens because you needed to start the whole muscle protein synthesis via mitochondria, I, I'm assuming. And so we think that's sort of where a lot of known ingredients in the space, whether it, it's immune with vitamin D, for example, there's a lot of uh, synergy with, with MitoPure. So that's how we are approaching it, with MitoPure as sort of the base in uh, bioactive that can boost cellular health. And then we add on well-studied, well-clinical research ingredients that add further benefits. Uh, and these will be products we'll be launching in the, the duration of the year. So have you looked at the effect of MitoPure on, say, the gut microbiome, or probably more importantly, at least to me, on the gut wall integrity? Uh, I happen to think that the, the gut wall is the holy grail of health span, among other things. Yeah, so we have started translating it. Most of the research, uh, there's a lot of research emerging now with excitement, as you mentioned, around this molecule. Uh, there's there's a group out of US uh, that has just basically published, and again, a very top journal, showing that the get barrier junction was improved following the relatin A intake. And, and, and this is was, again, done in preclinical models of uh, inflammatory bowel disease and, and and, and colitis and Crohn's disease, where they basically showed that supplementing with urolithin A was improving gut barrier junction and a lot of, uh, it was hitting on, on all these sort of leaky gut sort of uh, uh, bar, you know, that gets compromised with, with aging again. And, and so this is now, this is leading to human translation where we are starting to think of how, how to translate this in, in people who have irritable bowel syndrome or even irritable bowel, inflammatory bowel disease. So that's the one uh, area we are actively looking at, as you mentioned. And the other that excites us, just because the science is coming from the National Institute of Aging and the Buck Institute of Aging, is the potential urolithin A as a molecule has on, on improving brain health and, and really counteracting neurodegeneration. And, and they've screened thousands of compounds and will found that basically urolithin A is the top that prevents by activating mitophagy again. It's going to work from top to bottom is what you're going to, is what well, you're saying. Well, it's going to work wherever there is an organ and links to high metabolic demand, which is either A, a skeletal muscle, B, 
um, could be the cardiac muscle or, or the gut, as you were talking about. But the brain has a, brain cells have, have thousands of mitochondria and they get compromised. All right. So what makes MitoPure? Well, what makes it different is uh, my answer is, is, is a twofold answer. One that makes a difference is that uh, probably there are very few compounds that uh, people have studied and put the efforts to study it with the biotech approach for 15 years. And, and only when they believed that this molecule had health benefits have we brought it from the bench scale to, you know, the human research to the breakfast table, as I say, of people now that people can, you know, take it in their daily routine. And, and, and the second is that it's such a safe molecule. It's a natural molecule. It has been evolutionary, been present in, in through a diet. And of course, we've, a lot of us have lost the ability to make it. And, and, and it's very unique mitophagy activator, which is such a well-conserved anti-aging pathway that there are other mitochondrial nutrients that are known to, let's say, improve energy production like CoQ10 and L-carnitine, for example. Then there is the, the biogenesis side of mitochondrial improvement where you can take resveratrol or certain NAD boosters like nicotinamide riboside. But those will, in my opinion, will only work if you take out your trash bin, right? You can't keep putting more trash and suddenly expect that, you know, it will clear in a way and, and there'll be empty space for to have healthier mitochondria. So that's where I think this is so unique is that it takes out your trash, basically, and that allows newer healthy mitochondria to come in. Make sure to check out the next one here. The FDA finally employed new criteria for foods to meet and the following of these so-called healthy cereals are not making the cut. 